transcribed. CBS Radio, a division of the Columbia Broadcasting System and its 217 affiliated stations, presents the CBS Radio Workshop, radio's distinguished series dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Tonight, from Hollywood, a graphic and dramatic account of one of nature's most terrifying phenomena, Storm, from the famous book by George Stewart, adapted and directed by William N. Robeson, with William Conrad as narrator. Steadily, the great sphere of the earth spun upon its axis and moved in its unvarying course around the sun. From far off Venus, a watcher of the skies, if such a one can be imagined to exist, viewed it as a more brilliant planet than any to be seen by us earthmen. It gave no sign that storms or men disturbed its tranquil round. Bright against the black of midnight, or yellow in the dawn, the earth hung in the sky, unflickering and serene. San Francisco Weather Bureau. Fair tonight and Wednesday, no change in temperature. Moderate northwest winds. You're welcome. The same forecast, day after day, week after week. The junior meteorologists wanted to yell blizzards, thunder, lightning, and hurricanes... But as long as that high-pressure area hung off the coast, it would be the same. Fair tonight and tomorrow. No change in temperature. This wasn't weather. It was a bore. And nothing on this morning's weather map could change it. Oh, there were storms. Plenty of them. Always somewhere else. Sylvia, an old friend, was now over Boston, dumping a heavy fall of snow before she swept on across the Atlantic. Felicia, poor thing, wasn't doing too well. By all indications, she would die in the fastnesses of the Northwest Territory. But Cornelia, ah, the junior meteorologist, was proud of Cornelia. A big, full-bodied dowager of a storm. 400 miles at sea, southeast of Dutch Harbor. He'd known all of them since birth, days ago in the far western reaches of the Pacific. And it was his private pleasure to give them names. His eyes swept across the map down the arc of the Aleutians and the islands of Japan. And then he saw something he hadn't noticed before. A ship halfway between the weather stations of Haridoyashima and Titijima had reported a barometric pressure of 1011. Yet by its position, it should have been 1012. The temperatures of the ship and the weather station showed too wide a divergence. The wind forces and the directions were at variance. Cold air from the tundras of Siberia had met warm air from the coral atolls of the Southern Ocean. So he rerouted a section of the 1012 isobar, drew a little ellipse like a football around the figure 1011. Mariah. This one shall be Mariah. A proud city, San Francisco, set upon hills, pearl gray in the winter sun, swept clean of smoke and dust by the steady wind from the sea. A city of towers and banners standing out stiff in the northwest wind. In the streets of the city, women clutched at their skirts and men at their hats in the invigorating sun-filled breeze. And they greeted each other with sparkling smiles. Great weather we're having. Puts life in a fella. But out in the country, there was a drought in the vast central valley. The grain and the grasses curled by drought ceased growing. And the well-to-do cattlemen ordered cottonseed meal at the Fresno mills. And in Tehama County, a not-so-well-to-do cattleman received a polite but firm letter from his bank. 
And an hour later, in the barn, they found his body hanging. Good morning, son. Good morning, sir. Is the map ready? Almost, sir. The last reports are just coming in over the teletype. Uh-huh. Nice little storm developing there west of Japan. You mean Mariah? I... Oh, oh. You well, named them, too. It was just to myself, sir. It must be nice to be new to the game. I used to do it when I first came to work here. Oh, you did? Yes, I called them mostly after heroes I'd read about in history books, Hannibal and so forth. I remember General Lee developed into a terror, but Genghis Khan... Well, I've been using girls' names ending in IA, but I'm nearly running out. There's Felicia over Hudson's Bay, and Cornelia's still doing fine in the Gulf of Alaska. Where'd this Mariah come from? Incipient. Day before yesterday, north of Titajima. She'll be watching. You know the old saying. What's that, sir? The Chinaman sneezing in Shenzhen may set men to shoveling snow in New York City. did bear watching. Half as large as the United States, she rolled across the Pacific at a thousand miles a day. Yet nowhere did she touch land, so vast and empty is the great ocean between the Aleutians and Midway Island. All over the top of the world rested unbroken darkness like a cap. Through that polar night, the flow of heat into outer space was like the steady drain of blood from an open wound. As the air thus grew colder and colder, it shrank toward the surface of the earth. Upon every square mile of snow-covered land and frozen sea, the air weighed more heavily with the passing of each sunless hour. Hey, Chief, look at the report from Copper Mine this morning. What about it? 1032. Up nine millibars from yesterday. And Fort Norman, 1035. That polar air mass is going to break out in Canada. Mm, well, maybe yes, maybe no. Well, there's no place else for it to go. And when it does, Mariah won't follow Cornelia and Felicia and the others into the Gulf of Alaska. She'll keep coming straight for the coast. Chief, it's rain in 48 hours and plenty of it. Well, maybe yes, maybe no. Oh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Chief. I guess I got carried away. That's understandable. You haven't seen as many storms come across this map as I have. No, sir. But don't go throwing around any 48-hour guesses. Storms are hussies, at least in this part of the world. I've known lots of them. Uh, storms, that is. You can't trust them 12 hours out of your sight. San Francisco Weather Bureau. Hello. Uh, let me speak to somebody in authority, please. This is the chief forecaster speaking. Uh, this is Bronington Steamship Company. We got a ship in trouble. She's just sent out an SOS. The Eureka related to us. Uh, what's the weather like out there? Can you give me her position? Uh, not exactly. The Eureka said she was six hours away. What ship is it? Uh, the Byzantium. In that case, we have it. She made a weather report two hours ago. She must have been all right then. Just a minute, let me check. Well, for heaven's sakes, hurry. It's mostly a local crew. They've got wives and families in the Bay Area. We've got to notify them. I understand. Uh, here we are. From the Byzantium reported, she has a nine-point wind. That'll be about 50 miles an hour. But it's going to get worse. In an hour, it'll be blowing a whole gale, 60 miles an hour anyway. For another hour, it'll be even worse than that, with gusts up to 70. It's a hurricane and a typhoon. Ah, uh, look here. There's no sense in panicking. It's not a hurricane. It's not a typhoon. It's a storm, a very big storm. Make that clear to your people and to the newspapers. The Byzantium... We'll be through the worst of it in the next two hours. After that, it'll fall off. But there'll be lots of wind for 12 hours and a heavy sea after that. I see. Well, isn't there anything you can do about it? I'm afraid not. We report the weather. We don't make it. Yes, of course. Thank you. Thanks very much. Well, son. Sir? You know, Mariah's a big girl now. A killer. <laughs> the Arctic islands and the ice flows of the Beaufort Sea, the polar air swept southward across the plains at 50 miles an hour, across Alberta and Saskatchewan. By noon, it engulfed Edmonton. Just before the winter sunset, Saskatoon and Calgary. At midnight, it crossed the border and invaded the United States. 
By daybreak, it had occupied much of Montana and North Dakota and was advancing on Minnesota, South Dakota, and Wyoming. But in San Francisco, the proud banners on the tall towers still streamed southeast in the winter sun. Continued fair today, no change in temperature. Got the map filled in, son? Yes, sir. Just finishing. How does it look to you this morning? Well, I said yesterday it would rain inside 48 hours. I say now it'll rain inside a 24 hours. Pretty sure of that, huh? Positive. Yeah, let me have a look. Uh-huh. Bill Mariah's come a long way in five days. Yes, sir. Look at that cold front east of the Rockies, right out of Canada. Just as I forecast. Did you forecast this, too? Hmm? What's that, sir? Part of your cold front slipped west across Alaska, far south of Seattle. Oh, well, uh, no, sir, I, I didn't expect that. Care to forecast the possibility of it continuing south? Well, sir, my guess is that Mariah will get here before it does. Son, in this game, you can't afford to guess. There are a lot of factors on this map that argue against rain. There's this cold front. There's the Pacific High. Still has well, been you. for weeks. Oh, there's Mariah, and nothing's going to stop her. Chief. Yes, Chief. Whitey. Chronicles on the why they want the forecast. Tell them I'll have it for them in ten minutes. You see, son, it's up to me. If I say that one word, rain, the weather forecast won't be in a box at the bottom of the front page. It'll be in boxcar letters in the headline. That single word will be the biggest news story in California. Thousands of people will change their plans because of it. Hundreds of businesses and industries will adjust to it. And if it doesn't rain... But it's going to. It has to. Would you like to take the responsibility of guaranteeing it? Uh, but, but, sir... On the other hand, if I forecast fear and it rain, that mistake might mean millions of dollars loss and the illness and the... Death for more people than a man likes to think about. Yes, sir. Of course, it's possible that the Pacific High will hold, and it's possible that the polar air will get here before Mariah does. Uh, but, Chief... but it's not probable. And we must forecast probable, not possible, rather. Whitey, yes, Chief. get on the phone and order up storm warnings on the coast from Point Arena to Northhead. Yes, you, son, call the Chronicle and tell them we'll have the complete forecast in five minutes, but tell them to set the headlines and get ready. It's rain. Rain. The load dispatcher of power and light was ready for the electric heaters that would be turned on against the chill and the lights that would burn later in the morning and earlier in the evening. Somewhere in his maze of high and low voltage wires, his powerhouses and his dams, there would be trouble. But he was ready. Rain. The plant superintendent of the telephone company sent some extra men up along U.S. 40 in case things went bad on the pass. Rain. The general manager of the railroad dispatched the assistant divisional engineer and the chief trainmaster to Immigrant Gap and Norton to take charge of track clearance in the pass. For rain on the coast, rain in the valley, rain in the motherload, meant snow on the pass. The Pass, one of the five great gateways to California. The first covered wagons crossed the pass in 1844 from the high plateau of Nevada to the gravid valley of the Sacramento, where yet unsuspected, gold lay in the sands of foothill streams. 500 wagons crossed in 46, crossed safely. All but the last, the Donner Party. The snow caught them. And the horror of their story has imprinted their name upon the pass and brewed still over peak and canyon like a legend of Greek tragedy. But today, gleaming streamliners glide between the snowy crags with 20th century ease. The transcontinental telephone carries chit-chat and the closing of deals, the word of birth and death, and the jokes and tunes of radio through the high canyons and over the summits. The great steel towers of the power and light high line cut their wide path through the large pole pines and the tamaracks as they march with metal feet across the mountain. 
and feeling its way more subtly, following the contours of the convoluted land, is U.S. Highway 40, the all-weather road across the Sierras, one of the five great mountain gateways to California. Far out at sea, the crippled freighter Byzantium, her rudder jury rigged, made for Honolulu and repairs under a sunny sky. She had ridden out the storm, but she had lost her first officer overboard. Mariah was indeed the killer. And she announced her coming with a wave of pain. As she moved steadily shoreward, old lumberjack joints grown stiff in the dripping of redwood forests, twinged and throbbed. From Cape Disappointment to Point Arguello, overworked mothers winced with headaches. Nerve ends of leg stumps tingled. Old wounds of the Argonne and Guadalcanal ached again. In a moving belt 150 miles before the rain, renewed tortures prevailed in the hurt and maimed limbs of men. <laughs> First, so fine was the rain, it was as if the low-lying mist had merely swooped a little lower. And then for a moment, it was gone. But it came again. But it came again. Minute by minute, unhurrying, the rain grew thicker and more steady. East, east beyond the Sierras and the Rockies, the river of polar air swept on. Behind it, the snow-plastered houses of Cincinnati and Louisville, the quick frozen ponds of the Ozarks. In Abilene and Fort Worth and Dallas, they felt it now, and men battling their way along gale-swept streets reminded themselves... Between Texas and the North Pole, the only windbreak is a barbed wire fence. Rain will not harm a high-tension line. Snow will build up on it and then fall away of its own weight and bulk. But ice... At the 3,000-foot level in the Sierra, the morning after the storm broke, neither rain nor snow fell from the turgid clouds, but sleet, sheathing the trees in bizarre robes of ice coating the wires of the power and light 60 kilovolt line until they were a half inch thick, an inch, two inches, until the weight became more than copper cable could bear. San Francisco load dispatcher. This is Ringo, substation operator. The French bar 60 kilovolt line just went out. Don't say just. When did it go? 902. I'm replacing it from Two Rivers and Buckskin Dam. Thank you. <coughs> the load dispatcher looked at his desk clock and noted with satisfaction that it was a little past 9.03. I know I'm seeing it, but I just can't believe it. What's that, son? For this morning's map. It just isn't supposed to look like this. Storms should move from west to east between the high-pressure areas of the pole and the Tropic of Cancer. They do, in the textbooks. But it looks like El Mariah's trap. Well, that's what I mean, sir. Trap between that polar breakthrough over the plains and the one that came in over Alaska. Why, it could go on raining for days. And very well might. This is a miracle of electronics. This is the multiplex telephone cable, carrying two or three radio programs, half a dozen personal conversations, and several teletype messages. Six of these cables cross the Donner Pass, strung from pole to telephone pole. The central transcontinental lead between San Francisco and the East. <laughs> Now, 
1579, the same year Sir Francis Drake landed on the coast of California, a cedar sapling sprouted on the lip of a ravine far up in the Sierra Nevada. It was, however, somewhat insecurely rooted. And in 1789, a half century before the first immigrant let his wagons down the canyon walls with ropes, a windstorm toppled it. Its trunk has lain athwart the ravine ever since, decaying but little in the high, dry mountain air. But last fall, a chipmunk burrowing beneath it dislodged a pound or so of gravel and thus disturbed its delicate and ancient balance. And the weight of Mariah's snow finished the job. Now the log begins to roll, slide sidewise, upends and drops over the canyon's edge. A hundred feet below, it strikes squarely among the cross arms of pole 1-243-76 of the Central Transcontinental League. Operator? Hello, operator. This is the operator. I've just been cut off from New York. I'm sorry, sir. The sorry's not enough. What's the matter with you people? Hold the line, sir. A company as big as yours, you'd think they'd give better service. Absolutely ridiculous. This is an important Here call. is your party, sir. I'm sorry for the delay. Yeah, you should be. Hello, Harry. Yeah, what happened? Who knows? Well, anyway, let's pick it up where we were before. You can't pick it up exactly where you were before, sir. Before, you were talking from San Francisco via Salt Lake, Denver, and Chicago. Now you are talking to New York through Los Angeles, Oklahoma, and St. Louis. Over one of the alternate circuits which had been previously set up by a telephone company traffic superintendent who knew what a storm could do on the Donner Pass. <laughs> You were right, Chief. Huh? Look at this morning's map. That polar air that broke through over the plains finally made it across Mexico. It's out in the Pacific now. Uh-huh. Joining up with Mariah. That'll be the death of her. But she'll give us trouble tonight. How's that? That old polar air mass is only a few hundred miles wide, but she's cold and dry below and warm and moist on top. When she hits Mariah, she'll blow her into bits. Cloudburst, hail and snow, thunder, lightning, damnation. Tonight will be the night. U.S. Highway 40 was still open, but only because the road superintendent and his crew had pushed the flangers and the rotaries around the clock for nearly 72 hours. Now the snow was thicker than ever. And the superintendent standing at the doorway of the maintenance station garage was tired. Bone tired. A heavily pounding truck came up grade from the west. A sedan, its headlights clawing the swirling snow, followed. And a few moments later, another. And then something began to bother the super, something vague. And then he realized what it was. Wally. You. Let's get out on the road. What's up? She's blocked somewhere down the pass. Nothing's coming through from the east. She was blocked, all right. At Wendy Point, a big truck and trailer was jackknifed across the road, and the drifts were already piling up. Four cars were lined up great. Their motors running. Idiots. Motors idling, windows closed to keep warm. Wally, tell them to open up before they suffocate. You. I'll take the downgrade side. Anybody hurt here? Nobody hurt, but this truck. Never mind the truck. You ran past the chain warnings yourself. If you'd had chains on, you wouldn't be stuck in that drift. Yeah, but look, hey, what am I going to do? I can't. Hey, anybody in there? Oh, no. Hey, you. Oh, me? Yeah, you. Where are the people from this car? Oh, them. Yeah, what happened to them? Oh, yeah. Yeah, all them and a guy. She was sort of hysterical. She yelled something about we'd all get snowed in and froze like somebody named Donna. Then they start off down the road walking. Hey, you think maybe we ought to start walking like she said, huh? No, you stay where you are. We'll get you out of this. When did they leave? About five minutes ago. And that's long enough. 
Hey, what's the matter up ahead? Road's blocked. You see a couple of people walking down grade? Yes, we wonder. You got chains? Sure, I always got chains. I'm from Colorado. Good, then you must know mountains. Now listen to me, Jack. I'm the road superintendent here. We aren't going to be able to clear the road for a while. Why don't you swing around while you still can go on back down grade after those two people? Well, now, I don't know. You might save a couple of lives. Why, of course we will. There's a joint down at the bottom of the pass where you can get them some coffee. We'll let you know when the road's clear. Well, sure thing. Uh, glad to help. Thanks a lot. You better get going. One of my rotaries is coming up behind you. I had no idea you got so much snow out this yeah, well, way. Yeah, we get enough. Shut the window, Emily, and let's get out of here. Hey, Steve! Hey, Peterson! Give me a lift! Hi, boss! What you doing down here? I'll tell you later. Raise the plow, Steve, and get me up the road as fast as you can. Radio hot. That's a pistol. Well, let's go. KRDM4 calling KRDO1. KRDM4 calling KRDO1. KRDO1 is standing by for KRDM4. Hank, get this. Fault all eastbound cars at the summit. Phone the boys at the lake to stop all westbound cars at the gates. Contact the highway patrol and tell them there's a block at Windy Point. Get a couple of men off the day shift and send them down with a push plow and flanger. We're going to lose the road if we don't work fast. To lose the road was to lose his honor. But that night, as Mariah thrashed across the Sierra and her death throes, the superintendent once more held the road. Once more, the storm gave out before his machines did, or his men. Once more, there would come a time and a storm, he reminded himself, when they might not. San Francisco Weather Bureau, fair today and tomorrow, moderate northwest winds, slightly cooler. You're welcome. The junior meteorologist turned back to his map, filling in reports from land stations across half the world and ships spun out upon the great ocean. But soon he let his eyes wander down the Kuril Islands and across the Sea of Japan, where surely a new wave should be forming, a wave which might develop into another great storm like Mariah. But now, no ship happened to be at the proper location to tell him about it. Tonight, the CBS Radio Workshop has presented Storm by George Stewart, adapted and directed by William N. Robeson, with William Conrad as narrator. Featured in the cast were Helene Burke, Chet Stratton, Herb Butterfield, Byron Kane, Harry Bartell, Tony Barrett, Barney Phillips, Frank Gerstel, and Jack Crucian. Sound patterns by Ray Kember and Bill James. Original music for tonight's program was composed and conducted by Jerry Goldsmith. The workshop is produced by William Frug. Transcribed. America listens most to the CBS Radio Network.